I want us to try something and while we do this, I want you to pay particular attention to how you feel. Ready? Okay, let's go. Right, stop. How did you get on? How did you feel? Bored, awkward, weird. Maybe you were checking your phone, maybe you were making comments to the people around you, maybe you even hit refresh um, on your device because it looked like this was glitching or something like that. You know, that was just 30 seconds, but it probably felt like a lot longer. We are just not used to having to wait. Uh, it, and it's like everything in our culture around us is, is really steering us away from developing patience. And in fact, um, probably cultivating in us a, a, a sort of sense of impatience. And that's something that we want to talk about today because we're continuing our series on the fruit of the Spirit. This is this notion that comes to us from Galatians chapter 5, which is a book uh, written to people, Christians, living in a place called Galatia. And written by a guy called Paul. So let's just read it. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In other words, the evidence that the Spirit, who is God, is present and active in your life are these things, including patience. Now there's a kind of patience which is just the ability not to get distracted. But I want to dig a kind of a layer deeper than that. I think there's something bigger that we need to talk about. You see, um, in this passage that Paul's written, he talks about, yes, the fruit of the Spirit. But earlier, he talks about the acts of the flesh. It's kind of like the opposite. Let me have a look at what it says there. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. This is a kind of list of the opposite of what we see in the fruit of the Spirit. If the fruit of the Spirit is what we see when the Spirit of God is particularly active and present in somebody's life, then the acts of the flesh are when uh, the Spirit is not particularly involved. When a person kind of blocks out God's involvement in their life and just kind of goes about things themselves. And if I was to look at this list and sort of pick out like what seems to be kind of the, the opposite to patience, I would have to say it's fits of rage. It's anger. And the opposite of patience, the way I want to talk about it today, is not just impatience. The opposite is anger. Now you might ask, well, what's wrong with anger? Is anger actually wrong? And I'd say actually in the Bible we see that anger itself is not actually wrong. Take this verse, for example, um, in Ephesians chapter 4. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. That's actually a quote that that first part, in your anger, do not sin, is a quote from Psalm chapter 4, verse 4. And so it's saying, you know, anger itself is not a sin. It's not wrong to be angry. And there are times where anger indeed is the right thing to do or feel. You know, um, we even sometimes talk about righteous anger. There are things to get angry about in this world. And often when we want to fight or we are, are willing to fight for it, against injustice and fight on behalf of people who are being unfairly treated, which is a, a very important form of love, um, often that is motivated by a kind of righteous anger. So not all anger is wrong, but what this is saying, in your anger don't sin, is that when you're angry, you're particularly susceptible to sinning, 
to doing the wrong thing. And I think we'd probably all admit, even just at a kind of instinctive level, that um, somebody who's uh, characterized by fits of rage is hardly the kind of person who we would say, yeah, I can see God in them just right there. You know, like, oh, so Jesus-like. You know, somebody who's just prone to fly off the handle, we, we recognize mm, they've got a problem. And I'd say in, in many ways, New Zealand culture has a real problem with anger. I mean, just think about violence in our culture. You know, um, we've heard a little bit about a so-called coward punch um, quite a bit in the media over the last few years. And in fact, in May, um, Fal Vake, uh, a professional uh, MMA fighter here in New Zealand, um, was hit by one of these coward punches and killed. Not in the ring, by the way. This was not in a bout. Um, somebody came up to him from behind while he wasn't looking and knocked him out and killed him. Now, that's particularly extreme. Um, it's an example of anger in our culture, sure. But even more prevalent and probably more worrying is family violence in our, in our culture, in our country. You know, we market ourselves as sort of 100% pure New Zealand, as this kind of paradise on earth. Uh, and we kind of embrace that. And yet there is a dark underside to New Zealand life, isn't there? And there's a lot of people who are going out and, you know, putting up a facade of being good, honest folk. And, and then when they close the doors, they unleash on those around them. And it could be verbally, sometimes it's physically. If that's you and your family, um, in your household, then I really implore you to ask for help. You're going to need help and you must ask for it. Thankfully, that's probably not most of us. And yet I wonder if a lot of us can still see in our lives that even if it never gets to that level, that we struggle to show patience to the people around us, that we do get angry and in our anger, maybe we are actually sinning. We want to cultivate this or we want the spirit of god to, more accurately to cultivate in us a kind of patience and in order for that to happen we have to have the right condition here we are uh fruit tree i think this is might be ugly fruit but i'm not quite sure so if anyone knows um i'd appreciate you letting me know but you know fruit is a good metaphor because uh when it comes to trying to grow fruit there's not much that we can do we can kind of um try to help what we can in terms of the conditions and putting things on the soil fertilizer or what have you but the growth just happens and when it's with the fruit of the spirit it is something that it just happens um, but we can think a little bit about what the right conditions are and I think in many ways the conditions that God uses to shape our character is suffering hardship and challenges that is the soil for the kind of character that the spirit of god works in us and i want to give you an example of that i was always mr chill until i became a dad you know i really didn't think i had a problem with anger until i had kids and i definitely wouldn't call having kids suffering it doesn't really feel like the right word i mean there's so much joy and purpose that that's involved but Definitely, it's hard, and we all know that. You know, we joke about it and we post memes about it, and it's funny, you know, because the joys outweigh the 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 lows. I guess I, I hope most of the time, um, but man, it's not funny at certain points. And I was finding that as a young dad, I was blowing up a lot. And one day, my wife just called me out on it. And you know how I responded to her critique? With anger. I mean, I wasn't happy about it. But once I'd cooled off, I realized she's right. I am just blowing up in a way that I don't want to be that kind of dad. I don't want to be... I mean, there were definitely fits of rage there. And I don't want to be another angry dad. They do untold damage. And more importantly, that's not the kind of person that somebody indwelt by the Spirit of God should be. I should be somebody who's characterized by patience. So I've had to be patient and in, in seeing the Spirit of God do some work in me in that way so that I'm not blowing up at my kids. I'm not characterized by fits of rage. 
But my point here is that the soil that the Spirit of God is working in was a kind of hardship, a real kind of challenge, you know? Everything was fine until things got tough in my life and I realized, oh, there is some real work in the area of my character that needs to be done um, in terms of anger. And so it's that, that it's the suffering, it's the tough stuff in life that the Spirit of God uses to grow the fruit of the Spirit. And it is the work of the Spirit. It's God's work. It's not what we do. If we kind of close off our lives to the work of the Spirit, we're just going to go, I'm just going to go about being a kind of a, a good person. This is what Paul means when he talks about the flesh, by the way. He's not talking about physical reality. Paul's got no problem with the physical world. What, when he talks about the flesh, he's talking about, you know, um, a kind of energy or a way of living that kind of keeps God out. And if we're going to keep God out of our lives, we're likely to end up with either full-blown fits of rage um, or a kind of counterfeit version of patience. Um, and the counterfeit is cynicism. This idea that cynicism is a kind of counterfeit version of patience comes from a well-known preacher and teacher, um, Pastor Tim Keller. And his point is that, you know, cynicism or just kind of not caring kind of leads to something that kind of looks a little bit like patience. But then if you look a little closer, you realize it's different. It's a counterfeit version because think about it, it's quite easy to be patient about something or seemingly patient about something when you just don't care. You know, like I'm endlessly patient about the traffic problems in Wellington. You know, like I, I love the city, but I don't go there that much. It just doesn't really bother me. Traffic problems in Tauranga, where I'm um, there often a couple of times a week when we're not in lockdown, um, that kind of bugs me a little bit more, you know. But if we just don't care, then it's kind of easy to kind of have a counterfeit version of patience, but it's really just a detachment and a, a lack of caring. And we're never called as Christians to just sort of not care. You know, um, before when I was reading the um, Galatians 5 passage, the fruit of the Spirit, out of my Bible, I was cheating a little bit because I used the word patience. But in actual fact, in the NIV, uh, which is the version I was using, it actually uses the word forbearance. And that's kind of this old-fashioned, crusty-sounding word. But one thing I like about forbearance in this instance and what we're talking about is it does kind of carry the idea of of bearing up and carrying a burden. In other words, it's not just putting the burden down and just being like, I don't actually care. But it's actually like going, no, I'm going to, um, well, think about it with it in terms of people around us. I'm going to endure with them. I'm going to um, bear up, not because I don't care, I do care, but I'm going to be patient with them. Keep showing love and not just fly off the handle and rage at them. And that is the real kind of patience. Um, so real genuine patience is is gritty, determined, active, and hope-filled. How do we do it? Well, I think part of the whole point of this fruit of the Spirit idea is that we don't do it. It is the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God taking the, the suffering and the challenges and creating something beautiful in us out of it. But like I said before, there, it does take some sort of cooperation on our part. And uh, part of that cooperation is, is learning to say sorry. And not just say it. I mean, there are people who have problems with anger that become experts at saying sorry. I'm sorry, babe. I'm so sorry. It'll never happen again. And it always happens again. Um, what we're talking about is repentance, you know, is actually saying a very genuine, I'm looking to change. And we say it to the people around us that we're hurting. And we say it to the Spirit of God. It's a, like an opening up and saying, I want to cooperate with your work in creating good fruit in me. Uh, I guess a couple of kind of practical things that I've found is I've thought about and reflected on how the Spirit of God has worked in me in, in small ways, but things that I've seen in my life. There's a couple of things. I think one thing is having a vision of who you want to be and become. You know, when my wife confronted me, it was like she held up a kind of mirror and said, this is who you are right now. And when I saw that person in the mirror, I go, 
that's actually not who I want to be. That doesn't match up with the sort of mental image of the me that I want to be or should be. It certainly doesn't look like Jesus. And that is what the Spirit of God is trying to do, is trying to create in us um, almost like a, a Jesus image. And having that helps. But I think it also helps to have um, somebody that you actually know in the flesh um, up close that you can rub shoulders with and actually somebody who demonstrates that kind of patience, Jesus-like patience in your life. I think it just helps. You can see how they act when, you know, they get a, a flat tire or they're stuck in lockdown or their kids are driving them crazy, you know, and and that I think can become a kind of model. We want to be like them because they are like Jesus in this way. I think another thing for me is I realized too that even though we you know, when we talk about like losing your call, um, uh, having a tantrum, you know, lo um, losing your temper, it's almost like the, these images of sort of being out of control as if it was beyond your control. But I realized that at some level, deep down, I had given myself permission to get really angry. There were certain lines that I wouldn't let myself cross. But I had drawn some lines and said, hey, so long as I don't cross those lines, I'm allowed to get really angry, you know. And so part of it was almost like just retracting that permission and saying, I'm not going to give myself permission to be that kind of person and redraw the lines. Now, it's not easy. Um, it's work of the Spirit of God. Um, but for some of us too, it's going to take, well, it would, we would benefit from professional help. And, and, and you don't necessarily have to be abusive to need professional help. Um, a lot of us have just had a hard hand dealt to us in life. And a lot of stuff that have instilled in us a sense of anger, and you're not to be blamed for that, but you are responsible to do something about it, or perhaps more accurately, to open yourself up and, and take actions that are in cooperation or going with the grain of the Spirit's uh, activity and ambition for you, who you were created to be. And I just want to mention one area where I think we need to do better, and that is in the area of social media. I mean, social media is this platform where people are having fits of rage. People are just unleashing, and the church is no different. You know, we hear a lot about our culture being really polarized, and I think we're seeing that reflected in the church. The church is really polarized, and when it comes to social media, a lot of us have really kind of angry uh, presence. You know, we've it's almost like we've given ourselves permission to act in a way that is probably more characterized by fits of rage than by the fruit of the Spirit, that is patience. And um, to this, I would want to pull on what James says in James chapter 3, verse 10. He says, Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. You know, you might be here praising God, and yet when you get on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, you're cursing. And then James says this, My brothers and sisters, this should not be. My brothers and sisters, this should not be, you know. We should not be the kind of people who are characterized by praise when it's sort of okay and, and socially expected, but then when you get on the internet, um, unleash and be known for cursing and, and be known for anger and a lack of patience. And so this is one area where we um, probably need to do better. Wouldn't it be great in such a polarized kind of culture and a culture where people do just kind of... Um, let the anger go, you know, and have fits of rage. And, and especially in the online world, it can be celebrated um, and, and nurtured and cultivated. Wouldn't it be great if we were known for the kind of people who engage with people with patience? Only the Spirit of God can do that. And so I want us to pray and ask for the Spirit's involvement. But before we do that, I want us to close the same way we started, which is uh, with a prolonged period of silence. And as we do that, some questions are just going to come up that I want you to think about.
Holy Spirit, many of us are impatient and worse, we're angry, prone to fits of rage. We don't want to be like that. We want to be like Jesus in whose image you're shaping us. Take the soil of suffering to bear the fruit of patience in us, we pray. May we as a church be a people known for our gritty, determined, hope-filled, long-suffering patience. Amen. Hey, uh, it's um, my pleasure to be talking to Richard Goodwin this morning. Kia ora, Richard. Kia ora. How are you, my friend? Yeah, doing well, thanks. Yeah, yourself? Mm. Yeah, doing well. Yeah, actually doing okay. Doing okay. Um, actually, it was really lovely to be together in the service this morning. I think there's something quite precious about just knowing there's a whole big bunch of our church community watching online together and just um, being drawn to the word and appreciating our saviour and stuff at the same time. So I, th I think that's good for the soul. Yeah. Sure. Um, well, a couple of initial sort of things, Richard. Um, one is thank you for your little country calendar segment. Um, that was awesome. Uh, we are uh, being told by that it is likely to be a tangelo. Um, so we'll have that confirmed. There may be okay. a genetic testing we can do at some stage to confirm that, but um, that is something that has been proposed. Hey, um, I was going to ask you, who's the dude in the picture on your wall next to your next to your bookcase up there? Martin Scorsese. He's oh. a film director. Yeah, okay, um, all right. <clears throat> uh, and so um, he's just a director. I like. I'm not sure why his eyes are closed, um, but I bought that in Melbourne. Um, we were at there's a there's a museum of cinema in in melbourne and i bought that from there mm. so some people would know but maybe not everybody your your particular line of academic research and your phd and others was was in what particular area richard yeah movies um faith and movies or theology and movies mm. awesome yeah um well, yeah so talk... man scorsese sorry to cut you off there jeremy no. man scorsese is a kind of um uh, I guess um, theologically and spiritually interesting director, and and probably probably one of his um, more interesting movies in that area is a movie called Silence, which is based on a book by a Japanese Christian, and um, a novel, but um, very kind of powerful, thought provoking um, uh, story about missionaries. Can you hear me, Doug? Okay, all right. Um, well, you've got me for for a moment, and uh, when Richard comes back on, he'll he'll join us. So, yeah, Richard has done a lot of work in this space around theology and and film, in particular areas with that. And um, I'll, I'll love to at some stage have a a all with him about that because it's it's actually quite fascinating about how it's, it it uh, draws us in there. If you have questions, please can you write them on the Church Online platform i can i can get them here there's a slight delay but i'll, I'll pick them up and um richard and i can just have a little conversation about what is going on richard's just dropped off so um when he comes back and joins us we can um have a little conversation in that space all right um but while we're while we're just thinking about this i um I, I, one of the questions I was going to ask Richard, and maybe you can just be thinking about it in your own homes for a moment, is it's often talked about that our current model of today is an age of rage, that um, anger, resentment are, are really on the, on the rise, on the increase. And so I was going to ask Richard, but you might have a little chat at home now about why do you, how do you see that? How are you actually seeing it in the environment? that makes you say we're more angry as a kind of group of people. And then why do you think you're seeing it? Why do you think you're seeing it? So while we're waiting for Richard to come back on, just take a couple of moments and have a chat with whoever you are. How are we seeing it? And why do you think we're seeing this increase in anger and resentment?
Can you hear me? Ah, oh, we can, Richard. You are back. Yeah, sorry about that. I um I don't know what happened. My computer just cut out and started rebooting, and it's never done that before. So my apologies. <laughs> No, that's all right. We love technology. What we did is, is um, the first questions I was going to ask you, um, I've actually got people at home to think about. So um, uh, you can tell them whether they're on the right track or not. And the question kind of mm -hmm. has two parts to it. We're, we're in an age of rage. You know, most commentators are sort of talking about that. The question is, mm -hmm. how, how are we seeing it? And then we'll look at why. But firstly, how, how, do you, how are you seeing it, Richard? Yeah, social media is probably the first thing that comes to mind. But um, reflecting on this, it was just interesting to think and remember that um, when the Columbine shootings happened in the aftermath of that, which I think was like sometime around 99 um, or around the turn of the millennium, um, a well-known documentary filmmaker, Michael Moore, put out a, a documentary called Bowling for Columbine. And his sort of argument in that documentary was that news media was making us more angry and anger was making us um eventually he sort of felt like that was leading to school shootings um and at the time that seemed to make some sense but now with the advent of social media because that was all pre-social media i can see the two working together because social media has become a way that we consume news but it's um, news through the filter of our friends and news through the um, through algorithm filters as well so that it becomes um, quite tailored towards us. And so there's that thing that experts talk about with confirmation bias, which is yep. I already sort of think something and then I tend to be more attuned to those bits of, say, news articles that tend to back up what I already think. And I tend to dismiss the things that I, that challenge that. In social media, I may not even see those um, those types of media. So I think the media, if you like, has a tendency to kind of trade in in anger a little bit, and then social media probably amplifies that a bit. That's my where I'm seeing it. Yeah, I, I think you're right. It, it 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 sells, and there's a big pressure on them to sell. I remember hearing recently about a big shift that happened um, again, this is in the States, but when they went to 24 hour news channels and uh, at the time people were like, how are we going to have 24 hours worth of news? There, surely there isn't that much kind of news around, but they actually started generating news and going down this particular kind of path. And they, they know that fueling sort of an anger and resentment um, sells news very well. And people are, have this, I don't know, this um, dark attractant to it um, in, a, in a particular way. We feel empowered when we're angry and resentful about things. So it really has seemed to. Right. Um, yeah. Why do you think, though, I mean, that started to dig a little bit into it. Why, why do you think it sort of is, is continuing to be on the increase? I don't, you know, um, I'm not an expert in this, by the way, and I think when the way I approached the sermon was reflecting on just like what's my own personal journey. Um, it's not like I've done a lot of research or in, the, any, in this area. So just I sh shared more out of my own experience of patience and, and anger and and how I've seen God at work in small ways in my life. So um, no, I'm no expert, but um, why? I mean, obviously humans have always had a problem with anger. Um, and so at some level, it's just the result of living in a, a fallen world that makes us angry and having to deal with anger or sin in our anger as a result of the fall. But there are probably things in our culture that um, tend to feed into it. So I've already talked about how um, news media and social media um, can uh, kind of feed the flames of uh, anger. And I think that that just is probably worth um, pointing out or emphasizing a little bit because um, it does become an echo chamber. And that's um, one of the, I guess it is actually a real kind of almost ethical problem with um, social media and not just social media, but all the kinds of media we consume now are tailored towards us. Like, for example, if you think about Netflix, um, 
Netflix um, picks out the stuff that it thinks you want to watch. And, and so my experience of Netflix is totally different from even my wife's experience of Netflix because um, it's just tailoring everything. And so everything um, is tailored towards us. And so we, over time, we consume different media and we come out with really different opinions. Um, this was brought home really um, forcefully to me this week because Pathways has recently um, started a podcast um, and we've had some responses to the podcast and the responses you get are so divergent. You get the sense that it's not just people working with the same information and forming different opinions, but people are actually working with different information. They're different, working with different news sources. And so the sense of impatience with each, with the other side, if you like, with yep. people who have a different yep. view is exacerbated because you think, look, it's so obvious. Look at you, you know, just read the articles, just look at this. And it's so obvious. And that's like, well, other people may be consuming a completely different sort of diet. And so I, I yeah, I just think that um, that is feeding into a sense of anger. The other thing I would say is that um, social media is an easy place for us to be angry. Um, and I did a little bit of quick reading about that this week. Um, and that, um, you know, what is it about social media that makes us angry and the science behind that? And, um, you know, it's sort of probably the stuff that um, you would just intuitively probably arrive at, which was that um, sometimes it's anonymous. Um, you know, when you see people posting on things, um, sort of public forums and so on. Um, but even when it's not anonymous, it is disembodied. Um, and it tends to foreground people's opinions, which may be the part of them that we least like. You know, there are people that um, I really like in person um, and really connect with, but we have differences of opinions. On Facebook, those opinions sometimes are almost all I see of that person. And yeah. so it kind of almost gives us a yeah. distorted picture of people. <clears throat> That's what I think. What are you thinking? Mm. Yeah, yeah, well, I, I think, yeah, yeah, well, I think, I think, yeah, I think, yeah, I think, yeah, I think that nuance is lost in social media space, isn't it? Um, the ability yeah. to actually uh, ask questions, see where somebody is coming from, maybe why they've come there, what's their life journey in bits and pieces that often feed into an opinion. The social media platform mm. is, is designed kind of give your opinion and then everyone sort of just jumps in and, and, um, and comments on whether that opinion is correct rather than working through something with it. Um, it's interesting what you're saying though about how it's the media is tailoring stuff to us. It does make me think though that there's something in our fallen nature that um, is being recognized. You know, I think the media these days are, are very cleverly understand the frailties of human nature and are picking that up um and then exacerbating it so so it does then this idea you know that we have in scripture that there's a selfishness that we sort of have um a, a, a pushing towards a, in many ways division and disagreement and they they just sort of feed very strongly off it yeah i think anger feels good um to some degree or maybe initially um, and that's probably not great, but um, probably just the reality of our, na our simple nature, at least, is that we like the feeling of unleashing sometimes. If, if there's somebody that says something that we don't like, we like the, that, the initial feeling of maybe power, um, of uh, maybe a sort of distorted sense of justice, that we're kind of meeting out mm -hmm. justice um mm. but um so yeah it, it it does feel good and that's probably what um some of that media is kind of pandering to or tapping into mm. there's a, a well-known politician uh who, who won an election a few years ago and tapped into this idea of of he was accused of inciting anger in people and he said well we are angry you know we have a right to be angry and anger is energizing and if we're going to get our country back we need to feed off this anger and energy. And it was quite interesting that that, that kind of motivated in a very real way. And so we do, we feel some sort of entitlement and empowerment as we, as we get angry about things. 
But I just mm. wanted to explore for a second, Richard, because I, I do wonder in a lot of these spaces, we're talking about things that are a long way out of our control. You know, we talk, we get angry about um, uh, politics and climate change and plastics in the ocean and um, Afghanistan and things like that. They're, they're actually quite removed from our sort of um, da daily lives. And we seem to get angry about that. And, and, and so our resentment levels seem to rise up and, you know, I end up kicking my cat and, you know, yelling at my wife or whatever um, about things that are a long way out of my control. Mm. Mm. That's absolutely right. Yeah. I actually want to ask you about that, Jeremy, because you are not on social media platforms, um, certainly not on Facebook, and I'm not aware that you're on any. So do you, I mean, it's impossible to say maybe, but do you get a sense of like how that maybe shapes your sense of anger and what's going on in the world? Does it kind of give you a bit of distance from stuff? Yeah, yeah good question. I, um, it doesn't um, make me immune because I do still read a lot of news. So I'm still very exposed to a lot of media. And, um, and I do find it hard at times when I'm reading articles. And if I journaled and stopped and checked my emotions at the end of articles, there's that, you know, they're designed to to, to create an emotive response in you. And, and I mm -hmm. think the frustration is it creates an emotive response but gives me no possibility of resolution of these things. You know, these are, these are complex, difficult things that, yeah, I can recycle and have a worm farm, but, um, you know, I, I can't solve whatever you understand about climate change or plastics in the ocean. And so there's this, there's this frustration, I think, that is that, that sort of resentment that builds up and, and can, you know, so our, our, our base level, I guess, of, of frustration, instead of being quite low, is, is up here. And so then when people around me annoy me, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like maybe a few is ready to be lit or something. And so I, yeah, I, I had think, this... did you go Rich? <clears throat> well, I was just gonna say I had this this week um, because um, without going into detail, um, I was kind of getting dragged into a um, debate, a sort of a, a debate that's going on in society at the moment in a very small way and getting a lot of sort of um feedback this was through the podcast that pathways does and it was sort of like you know i'm here in lockdown and um most of this week um my wife was um going to her place of work and so i was really trying to just be a dad um but then occasionally i was having to like take phone calls and emails that was like What's your opinion on this and why did you say that and um and and so i noticed like there were times where i'd then i'd go back to parenting and i'd be a little bit testy you know because yes. it's like the problems of the world were yeah. making me more annoyed with my boys you know and it's it's just kind of how we are um i don't know what the solution to that is but i do there's a couple of things i guess you know i've heard people talking about having um media fasts and and taking some time out from social media um, and maybe even just news media. Um, pretty hard at the moment um, with lockdown. It's, you know, that when there's sort of a sense of crisis going on, um, we kind of want to tune in and know what's going on. But <clears throat> nevertheless, it may be useful for us to sometimes disconnect for a while as a bit of a detox. Um, the other thought I have is a little bit more theological, but I do think that some Christians have an under appreciation for what I call um, common grace. And mm. this is slightly, um, it doesn't quite get at what we're talking about, but I think it's somewhat um, relevant in that common grace is this idea that, that God is actually giving good gifts to everybody, whether they're believers or not. And, um, and that means that good things can come up out of so-called secular culture. And, and the reason why I think that that is relevant is sometimes as Christians, we can get into this uh, mentality that it's like us versus the world. And I, of course, at a very simplistic level, there's some elements of truth to that. And we could even find scriptural evidence for it. But I think in reality, it's more complex. The Spirit of God is actually active in all sorts of places. And there's, it's possible to find good things happening in secular culture there's a lot of rubbish as well but um the reason why i think that's relevant is because if we're consuming a lot of um negative media we can get the sense that 
the world out there is this um, terrible place and there are no rays of sunshine. There are no glimmers of hope. And I don't think that that's right. We live in um, God's world. There's a great hymn that I never hear sung in New Zealand, but used to be sung a bit in my church when we lived in America. And it's called This Is My Father's World. And it's all about, and it's an old hymn, but it's all about the fact that this is God's world. And yes, it's sinful. And yes, it's fallen. But let's not forget that there is an underlying goodness there. And by God's common grace, he preserves that. And so the world out there is not just bad, but there is a lot of bad stuff going on. Um, and we, but, but just having a little bit of balance there might help us a little bit too. Yeah, that's great. Um, we've got some questions rolling in. I'll get to those in, in, in a moment. But I just want to make a comment on that. I think that's really good. There's a, a, a Christian apologist um, who I've been listening to a little bit lately named Sean McDowell. Um, and many of you will know his father, Josh. Sean, Sean's very good. I really like him. He's, he's very sharp guy but he also um he does this act where he comes on and he's he he pretends that he's an atheist and then he answers questions from the from the audience and um one of the things that he does that's really interesting is at the end of doing that and he's he's quite you know he does the part really really well but at the end of it he gets he evaluates the audience of how they treated the atheists and he makes comments to them in regards to it and he says what 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 he often finds is that the the, the um, audience gets frustrated and angry and hostile, and he goes, I I, I I get I get it on an intellectual level and all that kind of thing, but you got to understand that this idea of of having kind of a graciousness about what you're doing, you've got the truth, but there's a way of of connecting and stuff in, and I think we lose that at times. Mm. Hey, okay, let's let's get to the people who they have spoken. All right, um, I think there's a good one to start with. Um, is there a difference between outrage and, and, and anger? So outrage is something we hear about and, um, versus anger. Is there a, a, um, a maybe a, a, some sort of difference in there? I don't know what the difference in meaning would be. Um, I, I don't know if that's getting at the idea of like um, good anger and bad anger or sort of righteous anger. Um, I'm not sure. Do you? What do you think? Yeah, that, well, let's go down that track because I think that's a really good one. I had written down, how do you know when you're, when you are angry but not sinning versus mm -hmm. anger and I am sinning? You know, is there some guidelines kind of with that? I actually, I thought about that and I thought of, um, I don't have a great answer, but just a couple of thoughts. Um, I was thinking about Jesus teaching in Matthew 5. Um You've heard it said that it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who's angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Um, again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court, and anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. So um, I think if you were to take this teaching just by itself and not um, include elements elsewhere in Scripture, you would probably say that... Um, Jesus' perspective on anger is that it is wrong, full stop. Um, because here he's saying, hey, it's not just murder. It's it's something as simple as just calling someone an idiot, like that just kind of betrays an inward anger. Um, and, that, and he says, you know, um, anger makes you subject to judgment. So um, there's not a lot of nuance that Jesus gives us there. But then when we put it together with all sorts of other things in Scripture, especially the character of God who is slow to anger mm. but we also know ha there is this thing god's wrath you know that god does show anger at times so obviously there is a place for anger so then thinking back to what jesus says here i guess i would want to say that maybe it's where um the kind of the fruit of the anger if the fruit is um leading you to insult somebody even if it's just saying you idiot um, which is kind of what Jesus is referring to here, then um, that'd be unhealthy. But if the anger, um, the fruit of your anger is driving you towards, say, um, fighting on behalf of somebody who's been um, unfairly treated or something like that, yes. um, then, then, then maybe that would be um, the right way to use anger. So maybe it's about the direction it goes and where we channel it. Mm. No, that's good. I think yeah, there's sort of, there's some sort of levels a eh, that it's describing in scripture with it, and and we have to find some vocabulary to to do that. 
So there's a, a frustration that if we you feel frustrated with something and we healthily talk about it with the people around us to, you know, because ang anger can often just build up and then it's exploding kind of out and, and we hurt people in a deliberate sort of hurtness. Whereas, a, you know, don't let um, the sun go down on your anger is something about sharing and verbalizing and working a process through. There's some sort of healthy way. And we know when you healthily work through your frustrations, you're often sharing with people your emotions that you're feeling and they get to say things in return and correct stuff off. So it's most appropriately done in community and where you can have resolution and things like that, which I think is, is part of that frustration and the, the more global ones. So cool. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay, here we go. Is is anger fueled by pride? For example, how dare you challenge me and my view? Um, yeah, yeah, I think there's that there that could be one a aspect of anger. Another aspect of anger would be um, insecurity. Um, I think sometimes as Christians, we get angry when our, our Christian views are challenged. Sometimes it's because we may not be that secure in them. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I think, or, you know, our theological position or whatever, uh, maybe that we feel a little bit threatened. We are um, finite creatures. We don't know everything and more, and on top of that, we live in a, a world where there are so many different views where I think we're all quite aware that maybe at some level we're aware that we're sometimes going to be wrong about some stuff and mm -hmm. that can be quite uncomfortable. And so if somebody starts challenging our views, um, it can feel like a threat and, and anger is a response to threat, you know, right. um, often. Um, and I guess if, if you sort of take it back sort of to the almost the most sort of animalistic kind of level, it's like you can imagine, um, you know, if a wild animal is trying to attack you or your kids or something, you know, like it's that fight or flight mode and anger is a part of that. Um, and so we feel threatened. So, yeah, pride is one thing. I think insecurity or feeling threatened would be another. Um, but then there is also this other thing, which is a se our sense of justice, our God-given sense of justice. And there are things that people's, there are injustices in the world that we should be angry about. I do wonder if sometimes righteous anger maybe spills over into unrighteous anger too, because there are so many people that I know that are really um, passionate about justice. And, and I think it's good and godly, but sometimes it just, it's almost gets kind of quite ragey and indiscriminate in how it's expressed, you know? Mm. Um, so just because we're angry on behalf of say somebody who's being hurt um and we could sort of say that's an anger a, a kind of righteous anger doesn't give us a free pass just to um you know lash out at everyone and any, anything you know mm, that's really good i like that i like that insecurity one that's another point that sean mcdowell would make in that you know part of your frustration is you guys actually haven't worked through what you what what you believe in your own minds and in, in a evidence-based kind of way and so you you fire back rather than actually just working through yeah i've thought about that and this is what i think so why, why do you come to that conclusion yeah so that's, that's really good um is there a way to gauge if you experience genuine patience as opposed to the to the counterfeit how would I know that I'm um, still, I guess, uh, that caring patience with somebody versus an uncaring kind of like de detachment, I think you described it as? Hmm. That's a good question. I suppose um, it just would require us um, tuning into our response to things, you know, like if it's somebody um, that we're close to who's you know, behaving in a way that we disagree with, if um, our sort of inward response is fairly apathetic, um, that would suggest kind of uh, a kind of cynicism or uh, cynicism, maybe not even the best word in that sense, but a kind of, um, yeah, a kind of apathy. Um, mm. But if, there, if our response is like, oh, gosh, that really sucks. Um, 
you know, so I guess it, that would suggest that, you no, know, you really are um, engaged and involved. Um, so I think that's probably takes a, just, yeah, a kind of self-awareness of like what's going on inside you um, because superficially they could kind of manifest in a similar way. But I think also you would, externally it would still look a little different. You know, if you don't care, you're not going to really take much action. Um, if you do care, you're still going to be engaged and involved and um, it's just not going to be in an angry kind of mode. Um, yeah. No, that's good. No, that's good. Okay. Um, okay. Is there any one thing that is a must-do, <clears throat> given Richard's analogy that fruit is simply the product or result of the Holy Spirit's work? So I guess it's kind of like there's a there's a whole lot of elements that sort of sit and play with it. It was actually a, a, a question that um, came up in our sort of group is uh, um, a little bit around, um, you know, developing more patience is something you go to anybody in the street and they'll go, oh, yeah, I probably should be a bit more patient and you can get a self-help book on that. You know, when we come down a little bit deeper as, as Christians, is there is there something uh, a little bit more key, I guess, in this sort of space? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, I don't know how clearly I articulated it. It is quite a difficult thing, a, a kind of a tension that we have, which is, you know, this stuff is completely the work of the spirit, but I do mm -hmm. think God doesn't um, force change upon us. That's just not God's MO. We just see in scripture that God wants us to kind of cooperate with what he's doing. And, um, and then we see examples of people resisting. Um, uh, it's not that God can be overpowered, but um, it just seems to be how God operates. He gives in his um, love, I would say, he, he gives us space to resist um, his work. And, and so I think, um, I suppose God could, you know, um, override that at any stage. But most of the time, I think God respects our choices. And so if we are not opening ourselves up to some at some level and cooperating with what the Spirit of God is doing, then, um, then I think maybe God might a lot of the time respect that to some degree. It's not to say that the Holy Spirit can't work in non-Christians' lives, by the way. I, I just, but I think that when we are um, Christians, we are, in a sense, um, aligning ourselves with and, and opening ourselves up more to the Spirit's work. And so um, uh, I kind of lost track of my train of thought there. What was the original? No, that's really good. That's really good. You articulated, articulated well in the articulated well. I, I love this phrase I, you used, this this phrase phrase you. spiritual um, cooperation, right? You, you describe flesh as a way of living that keeps God out. And, and so the contrast is the spirit is a way of, of living that keeps God in. And um, mm. you, you said um, the spirits, looking for the spirit's activity and ambition for you. One of the keys with the series is going, what 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 is the spirit's activity and ambition for me? And, and so I think you... I, I learned a bit in there, Richard. I think you verb, you gave vocabulary to it really well of going, there's this cooperation that's going on in there. And then when I fall short of that, I'm open to the reality that I need to, to have true repentance in that space and then step into a place and cooperating with the spirit where I move out of it and into a into a place that is really good. So, so that I, I thought that was really helpful, Richard. Thank you for that. Nice. Yeah, I, I wanted to say too, um, and not specifically in response to that question, but just something that you kind of touched on, and I think is important to all this, this, this whole conversation is, you know, going back to G, um, Matthew chapter five and, and Jesus words there about anger, he does go on to talk about reconciliation. If you feel angry, leave your gift at the altar is the idea of mm -hmm. stop worshiping and just go and resolve that problem. Um, and so maybe another way to kind of think about anger is not so much obsessing, did I have I sinned or not? Is this righteous anger or not? Is just what is the right way to use it or respond to the fact that I am feeling angry? And I'm a firm believer that we should just own our feelings. If you hate somebody, 
don't pretend that you don't, you know, just own it. I, I really have, I hate that person. I know that's not right, but I do. And I need to work on it. And so I need to resolve it. So it's like, um, yeah. So like actually going and, and re, um, reconciling. And I have to say, I, because I've been lucky in my family relationships and most close relationships, I don't have um, a great sort of personal experience of like long journeys of reconciliation and forgiveness with people. But um, it is something I've done a bit of reading about. And, um, you know, one of the things, themes that kind of comes out in some of the um, sort of theology around forgiveness is that um, in order for reconciliation to take place, truth has to be acknowledged yeah. and so when we reconciliation takes place it doesn't mean we pretend nothing bad happened and sometimes the person that's hurt us um will not acknowledge it they'll just they just refuse to acknowledge it i didn't do anything wrong um and if that's the case then we can still position ourselves in a place to be open to that person and uh, be willing to forgive, but for real reconciliation to take place, I think that they have to own it and say, I did that thing and I was wrong. And so I think, um, you know, truth telling is an important part of the, of how we resolve anger. We don't just sort of squish it down. We don't pretend it's not there. Um, but one thing to, we do to deal with it is we, we identify it, we talk about it. And so to bring it back to sort of like concrete life, in our homes, um, you know, it's way healthier to express what you're feeling and say, hey, I do feel a bit angry about this and um, I was disappointed when this happened. Can we talk about it and get on the same page than it is to do what I have traditionally done um, when I first came into marriage, which was like, you know, just store those hurts up because I thought that the way, the godly way to handle it was to pretend like it didn't happen. Yes. And I think that's a very New Zealand way, and you know, I'm sure there's other cultures that do it too, but I mean, it's a very uh, maybe European New Zealand way um, that we go, well, well, peace is where I just don't talk about those things that might cause conflict. And in actual fact, you're, you know, you're creating more issues down, down the track. Um, uh, th there is a Bible study on repentance. It's one of our church values this year, and, and that works through those steps that are, are, are existing with it. Um, including the final one of reconciliation. So if you haven't done it, I'd encourage you either individually or in, or in groups, jump on and do that. It's it's a very helpful in working it through. Um, one, one point, and then I've got one more question for you, Rich, before we close. Um, I think I think this this conversation has, has been interesting in the sense is that I, I think there's, we've got to differentiate in our minds the difference in how I emotionally react to large things that are going on in the world versus what's going on within my my community and so this idea of patience is got to be first and foremostly found in the community that is around me you know it might be family or friends or groups whatever you're part of within our church community rather than um, allowing these large complex issues that i am incapable of resolving um, um, to sit in that space mm. Okay, uh, last one. Um, Rich, the main descriptor used of God in the Old Testament, we had it in our reading in Psalm 103 today, is this idea of God being slow to anger. If, if, if God has this character trait, how is that helpful for us in our thinking about patience? Yeah, i actually really glad that you brought that question up because um, it wasn't something that I brought into my sermon, but that is actually a really precious um, description of God, precious to me personally. Um, one of the most significant moments in my own development in my in my faith was a moment where that notion of God being slow to anger um, uh, really just kind of clicked in a very deep way. Of course, I'd heard that phrase most of my life. Um, but, you know, sometimes we have layers of, of belief and or even though superficially I said, yes, I believe that at some deep level, I believe that God was actually quite angry. He was an angry God um, who who sort of loved us, but loved us a little bit like, a, um, I mean, excuse the um, 
excuse the kind of crude metaphor, but almost like a kind of the sort of trope of an alcoholic father, you know, that sort of like who just flies off the handle and says, you know, I, I, I love you and this is for your own good, but and, and is violent. And and I, I know that sounds kind of horrible to even say out loud, but like I said, I think we should just own how we feel. I think um, growing up, even though I'd always say, oh, God is loving and God is merciful. And I believe that at one level, I think if you dig down enough layers, I think deep down, I had the sense that um, God was an angry God and ready to fly off the handle. And you just had to kind of keep him placated, you know, um, and, and I think the Holy Spirit did something. I mean, that's another story, but the, the Holy Spirit did something in a moment in my life. And it was actually almost like a moment through reading scripture. This hasn't happened many times in my life, but something shifted at that deep level where I realized, no, God is slow to anger, abounding in love. And another way that it's put in, in Isaiah is that God's um, wrath and judgment is his strange work. So you think about it as a parent. Um, one thing that, I mean, on the one hand, although as a parent, you know, it, you, can't, you can get very angry, as I already talked about in my sermon. Um, the other thing that parents know is that actually disciplining your kids is, um, is not um, what you'd like to do. And even when they make you angry, most of the time, oh, a lot of the time, it would be easier just to let it slide. Like there are times where I have to discipline my kids and in a sense, um, be angry. I'm not talking about blowing up at them, but, you know, exp enforcing a bit of discipline. But actually, the easier thing to do would just be to like, laugh about it and let it go. But I know that that's not good for them. And so um, I think that's the idea of God's strange work is that any wrath that we see from God is God sort of putting on his sort of parent discipline hats and, and hat and saying, man, I love I love this person. And I love this child of mine. But you know, I I have to, I have to at times show discipline, you know, and that's more how God acts. It's not God lashes out because God's an angry, violent dad. Um, so our views of God are usually going to impact how we enact our faith and how, and the kind of people we become, I think. And so if we can get that picture of God, that God is not angry, God is slow to anger the wrath of God is God's strange work, but God is, as we learn in first John is love in his core. Um, then that's hopefully going to flow out into the kind of what we understand to be Christ like behavior, because in Christ, we see God in the flesh. Mm. That's awesome. That's real precious, Richard. It's a good way to close. Can I ask you to um, just pray for us all? as we reflect on this um, during this week and, and think about how patience operates in, in the spiritual cooperation we're doing with the Holy Spirit, um, his activity and ambition for our lives. Sure. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are slow to anger and abounding in love. We see this demonstrated in the giving of your son. And so Jesus, King Jesus, we praise you for your self-sacrifice and the evidence of the the love and the patience of God. We are so thankful for your patience with us. Um, and so triune God, we pray um, and acknowledge your goodness to us, your uh, patience with us. And we want to be the kind of people that reflect your character. So Holy Spirit, we ask for your um, work in our lives. Take the soil of suffering, because we all have it. Take the things that challenge us and test us and create in us a heart that is like yours, slow to anger, patient, enduring, not disengaged or detached, but deeply for the people around us um, and exuding uh, patience and love. We pray that for ourselves and we pray that for us as a body of believers too, that we would be people characterized by patience and, and a kind of long suffering love. Amen. Thanks, Rich. <clears throat> yeah. Good to be here. Thanks, Jeremy. Catch you later. Many blessings to everybody this week.